It has been a long week here in South Bend. Oh man. In a series of shocking developments, the Notre Dame Fighting Irish have finally beaten the rival school, Stanford Cardinal, by more than 30 points. <sighs> Hasn't happened in over 12 years. Oh, and we hired a new football coach. For further information on this and more topics, stay tuned. This is Shamrock Sports. <laughs> All right, so in this past week, Notre Dame has gone past the Brian Kelly era. We have hired Marcus Freeman as our new coach, 35 years old, the third youngest coach in the FBS. Uh, after four successful years as the Cincinnati defensive coordinator and coming over here to Notre Dame for one season at the same position, Marcus Freeman has just been hired for his first head coaching gig. Ben, JJ, let's hear these initial reactions. I could not be more excited for this Morgan Freeman, Marcus Freeman hire. He's a young coach, and with him and with the t duo between him and Tommy Reese being young guys, they can relate to the players. They can get the players riled up, but also he's a player's coach. The players love him. Recruits coming in love him. They've been tweeting all week about it, and they could not be more excited. And I'm very excited. Now, on Wednesday, when we taped Andy Sunrise, I compared uh, Brian Kelly to Mr. Perfectly Fine from uh, Taylor Swift's uh, famous discography. However, now that we've hired Marcus Freeman, I think we're starting to hit an all-too-well situation. I'm feeling pretty good. Yeah. This, by all accounts, is a slam-dunk hire for Notre Dame because Marcus Freeman is a guy that the players love. The players will go out and fight for him. They've said already, I forget who had the quote, we didn't come here to play for Brian Kelly, we came here to play for Notre Dame, and they want to play for Freeman. So I think in the short term, the bowl game, the playoff game maybe, we'll get into that later, that's the game the players are going to come out, they're going to come out wanting to win. Everyone saw the video where Freeman addressed the team. Those guys are hyped, they're ready to go. And in the long term, Freeman's a young coach with, a, by all accounts, a fantastic football mind. And I'm excited to see how he builds this program and how he now coaches. Now he has kind of control of both like how he wants to build the team on offense and what he wants to do on the defensive side of the ball. Yeah, JJ, you mentioned that uh, the players came here to play for Notre Dame and not Brian Kelly. Um, and I think that that goes for, for basically most schools. So what do you think the importance of hiring uh, in-house and, and keeping uh, the program on, in Notre Dame is going to be uh, going forward? Absolutely. You know, I mean, I think for Notre Dame, you're a team that, you know, it, it quickly became clear in, the, uh, in the, the hiring of Brian Kelly, that this is not the Notre Dame of old. Notre Dame coaches do not just stay at Notre Dame forever. There are teams that will make a big money offer and the allure of Notre Dame will not be enough to just keep a coach there. So I think the fact that Notre Dame has built some stability, the fact they're gonna hire from within, hire a guy that knows the program well, is a big hire for the Irish because it shows that you can build from within the program, you can get a high quality coach from within the program and keep the program stable going down the line because in college football these days, we've seen many, many great historic teams, Nebraska, Florida State, recent years, make the wrong hire and kind of fall off from grace. If Notre Dame wants to keep where they're at and keep building from where they're at as a top 10 team, maybe down the line a playoff, uh, you know, a consistent playoff team, that's where they need to be and that's the hire they need to make to just prove they can work from inside their own program, they can build up from inside their own program and if they, Freeman makes a higher defensive coordinator, because that's going to be big, seeing Phil's own position now, I think that's going to be kind of the position to watch, see if Notre Dame can continue building a program that self-sustains itself. Yes, and we also, you know, keeping Tommy Reese in house, that helps a lot too. Uh, keep stability within the program, going into bowl season. Uh, you know, Notre Dame's still competing for a national championship. Um, hoping to get into the playoff, need things to happen, but we want to keep things going as they are. The season has been a success to this point. Uh, we rebounded great after that Cincinnati loss. Uh, and Marcus Freeman, yeah, he's proven time and time again that you know, the players love playing for him. Um, and not even that. That, that. That's one of the main uh, components to Freeman's hiring. But also, the results are on the field. Notre Dame's defense this year was top 18 in interceptions, defensive touchdowns, sacks, turnovers, and third down percentage. And wherever Freeman has gone, the defense has followed. So I think that you know, Marcus Freeman, the hiring, is going to keep our defense strong. Uh, but as you mentioned, the players have really, really loved him. Uh, so he's known as, a, you know, he's heralded as a recruiter. Um, we have a really good class coming in. Uh, we're a top, a top linebacker class in 2022, and that's, you know, his positional group. So what do you think the recruiting implications are of this Freeman hire? I think it's huge in retaining recruits for the team. All the recruits throughout the week have been tweeting out that they love Marcus Freeman as the head coach. And say Notre Dame were to make an outside hire, maybe a Matt Campbell or a Luke Fickle, they would lose recruits, maybe even lose current players into the transfer portal. So I think it's huge in retaining players. 
Absolutely, and I agree. You know, if, if especially for players that you know USC, we have to consider them. You know, uh, for the last few years, USC on the recruiting trail at least has not been the threat they once were. With Lincoln Riley, you knew they were going to get a dynamic recruiter who could poach players. The C.J. Williams of the world. You knew, you know, Lincoln Riley is going to make a huge push for him. And I don't know who he's going to choose. He's a Notre Dame commit who might go to Southern Cal. But Freeman is a big step towards making sure those players have a guy they can relate to, have a guy that will be aggressive in making sure that players have already committed to Notre Dame will stay with Notre Dame, and players that can they can build the class further by getting will commit. To Notre Dame as well. Yes, and they, obviously the expectations here uh, with this Freeman hire, they're huge. Uh, we're coming off three double-digit win seasons in a row, and Freeman's job, he's tasked with carrying on that legacy. Um, so what do you think that Freeman needs to do? What big games does he need to win, or where does he need to take this team in the postseason, not just this year, but following to, uh, for, to get the immediate you know, re reaction that this was a great hire? I think it starts with this upcoming bowl game, whether it's the playoff or maybe a Fiesta Bowl appearance. If he wins a huge bowl game in his first game as the head coach, it would be huge for the future. It would also show recruits that he's able to step in immediately and take over the job. Yeah, I agree, Ben. I mean, the fact of the matter is, for all of Brian Kelly's successes at Notre Dame, he never did win a New Year's Six Bowl game. You know, it is, if he wins a New Year's Six Bowl game for him in this year, that would be, by all intents and purposes, for Notre Dame's team, uh, historic, not historic, but for the last decade, you know, an incredibly relevant event because that's not something Notre Dame has done in a while. They've made the bowl games. They've never won one uh, in the last few years, and they, they've made the playoff, never won a playoff game. If Freeman manages to pull off an upset in the playoff game or if he manages to win a Fiesta Bowl game, that is a big accomplishment, not just for Freeman, but for Notre Dame as a program. And going off of that, I've been around Notre Dame football for the last 10 years, and going into a New Year's Six Bowl game or even the playoff for the national championship like in 2013, I've been a little nervous going in, and I think that with the Marcus Freeman hire, the energy will just completely change, starting with the players, and it'll trickle down into the fans. Yeah, there's always a certain type of energy uh, when your team is heading into such a marquee matchup like that in the postseason. Uh, so hopefully Notre Dame can get into the playoff and we can see Marcus Freeman as the first. Well, you know what? He's not, gonna, he's not the interim head coach anymore. He is now the head coach. So I guess that, that, that wouldn't be uh, a first time ever type of thing. But probably the first ever, you know, brand new head coach, one game in. First that coach would, to win his first game in a playoff game. Yes, yeah, that would definitely be something. Uh, and that would be a really awesome title to, to add to the, early to the Marcus Freeman era. Um, but as I mentioned earlier, he is only 35 years old, one of the youngest head coaches in college football. Uh, I believe the youngest head coach in Power Five conferences, if you count Notre Dame in the Power Five, the little ACC schedule there. Um, so what do you think? You know, there, there can be some drawbacks to, to youth and inexperience, but there can also be some huge advantages. Uh, what do you guys see that age having a factor in, in the Marcus Freeman era? JJ? Frankly, I don't think it's a problem at all. In college football, sometimes you have to take risks. You know, since 2014, other than Nick Saban, every coach that has won a national title has been a first-year head coach. Granted, that's two coaches, Dabo Sweeney and Ed Orijan, Orijan. But, you know, the general rule still applies. Lincoln Riley, Ryan Day, Dabo Sweeney, these coaches are all first-year guys who got a promotion either in-house, out-of-house, uh, but they came in, took the head coaching office as their first job, and succeeded massively. So I think if you're Notre Dame, the youth is not a bad thing. It's, it's a risk, for sure. But it's no more a risk than bringing in Luke Fickle, who has never coached a Power 5 program, or Matt Campbell, who has never won a New Year's Six Bowl game. So I think, you know, there's inherent risk in every coaching hire you make. LSU is taking a risk in bringing in Brian Kelly, someone who has never coached in the South before. Every hire that Notre Dame can make as a big school with big expectations has some degree of risk to it. I think taking a chance on a young guy who the players love, everyone thinks is a brilliant coaching mind, is no more of a risk than LSU bringing in Brian Kelly, a guy who has never won a national championship at a program that expects national championships. I think youth is going to be huge with the players. I, I alluded to this earlier, but you know, if Marcus Freeman, or since Marcus Freeman has played football in the last decade or in the uh, in the 2000s, he can he knows what the players want and he knows what the players are going through, and so he can just relate to them a lot. Yeah, that's a good point you make there. You know, Marcus Freeman, former player, linebacker at Ohio State, he has a lot of experience in you know the new modern era of college football. Right. That stuff that you can really translate. I mean, we've seen it translate uh, on, at the coordinator level, and I think that we're definitely going to see that translate at the head coach level as well. But, and, you know, we've talked a lot about our great new hire in Marcus Freeman. Let's talk a little bit about our ex-head coach, Brian Kelly. He spent 12 seasons at Notre Dame, the winningest coach in Notre Dame history at 113 wins, made the playoff twice, the BCS championship once. He, what, he really, what he did was it was very, very impressive, taking a Notre Dame program that was previously you know, in shambles under Charlie Weiss, turning it around, making the championship in his third year. So what are some of the lasting legacies that, that you guys have taken from the Brian Kelly era? JJ? Yeah, I mean, I don't want to be the one to say it, but we do need to put some respect on Brian Kelly's name. I know, you know, everyone on campus loves hating on Brian Kelly, and, you know, it is just fine because leaving a team before a bowl game, objectively kind of a bad move. 
But, you know, in terms of looking at his resume and purely his resume, he has done a lot for this program. Just getting the program back to a place where winning 10 games every year is the expectation, not a surprise, is a big accomplishment that many Notre Dame coaches before him couldn't achieve. So I think he does need some credit for that. He needs some credit for, you know, everything he's done, the two playoff appearances, great memories, beating Clemson in 2020, great memories. But I think at the end of the day, Brian Kelly will be remembered as a guy that, you know, and, you know, I have nothing against going and chasing a bag for 100. If someone offered me 10 years and 100 million to fake a southern accent, I would do that too. But, you know, that is his legacy. And I'm sure he's not going to, you know, turn over in his bed at night if he wins at LSU. If uh, Notre Dame fans remember him as someone who left in the middle of the night to chase a 10 uh, year, $100 million bag. But if he doesn't win, that is his legacy. I think that if the show were to air on a Monday or on the Monday or the Tuesday of this week, when you know the situation was new, emotions were high, you know tempers were flaring, um, I would say that it was his legacy is kind of uh, along this idea of it takes a lifetime to build a good reputation, but a moment to destroy it. And I think that the moment that he left and it was in the middle of the night, he just goes to Baton Rouge. I think that that was the moment that could have destroyed his legacy. But you know, after some time, I've calmed down a little bit. I've got, I'm not as mad at him anymore. Um, I think that I need to be, we need to be grateful for all he's done. Like, you can't really ignore that he's the winningest coach in Notre Dame history. He's made such an important mark on the players' lives. He sends so many players to the league, which is their dream. This is what they've been working for, and he's been able to make that final push. And so I think that I'm just honestly grateful for some of the times that he had here. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, like, he's, you know, at the end of the day, we can dislike him for how he left, but you have to respect his resume at Notre right. Dame, what he's done for Notre Dame. You know, at the end of the day, it's a, it's a very good resume. It's an impressive resume. And I think that does deserve some credit, even if, you know, there are some probably grudges on campus about how he left, which is, you know, unfortunate. But at the end of the day, he is an incredibly successful Notre Dame head coach, and he does deserve due plaudit for that. Yeah, Ben, you made a great point about, you know, how we're still, it's only been four, five days since Brian Kelly has announced that he's leaving Notre Dame, so you know the reactions are still very raw, very emotional. I think when it's all said and done and looked back on in some years, you know Brian Kelly was a great, great hire for this program, and and you know what he did was nothing short of incredible. Um, so now you know we've been discussing Brian Kelly. What are some very big moments in his career uh, that you know as lifelong Notre Dame fans right. you guys have in the back of your memories? Yeah, I mean, you have to start off with last year, the Clemson game is, for us as Notre Dame students, you know, the most pertinent, you know. Yeah. I've, I'm, you weren't here, but, you know, you've been a Notre Dame fan all your life, so, yeah. you know, you know the feeling. Right. This was a game that, you know, for Notre Dame, it was really kind of a stick in the ground for the program because heading into the game, there was a fair amount of doubt in the college football world that we would be able to win this game. You know, it was big game Notre Dame. Every time they play a number one, number two team, they lose. And this was the game that proved Notre Dame could win. It was at home, so it's not a playoff game or anything, but it was still a statement. And, you know, rushing the field afterwards, those are the memories that Brian Kelly gave us that you know you can't take away from him right. and you know he can diminish it like you mentioned you know it doesn't take much to destroy a legacy but you know though you always have those memories if you're a Notre Dame fan of you know beating Clemson beating the number one team and you know for one night that year being the best team in college football right maybe not the biggest game but the game that comes to mind was the 2018 Citrus Bowl against LSU and I know I know it's very ironic you know we beat LSU we lose Brian Kelly to LSU but I just remember that last second touchdown when Ian Book throws a 55-yard touchdown to uh, Miles Boykin with a minute left. I was just jumping around my living room. I was so excited. And, you know, now that time has gone on and we lost Brian Kelly to SU, it just kind of sticks out to me. Yeah, both those games were, were awesome. Clemson game, rushing the field, one of the highlights of my life, easily. Um, and that LSU game was also a lot of fun. Capped off, you know, up and down season, but right. got a good win in, in a big-time bowl. Um, I look back and I see two games as two of my favorites. I, the Oklahoma game in 2012, that was probably our, our marquee win. Um, you know, going on the road, beating a, a high-level program in Oklahoma. Sierra Wood taking it to the house here right off the bat to give us the early lead. This game was awesome. And then not shortly after, Manti Teo with his Heisman moment, an incredible interception. Uh, this game, you know, we, we didn't really, no one really gave us a chance going in. And, and the fact that we beat Oklahoma to come from an unranked team uh, in the preseason poll to a national, to, to competing for a national championship was pretty awesome. The second game is the Michigan shutout in right. 2014. You know, it, it doesn't feel better than to beat Michigan and when to beat them 31-0 uh, with just a dominant defense. It, it felt really good. Uh, getting a, a good play here, Devin Gardner had nowhere to go this entire game. I still remember watching this game in my living room. And unfortunately, we couldn't find the highlight, um, but my favorite play of the game was the nullified pick six with zero seconds left on the clock uh, because one of the Notre Dame defenders went and hit Devin Gardner on, on the return, got an unnecessary roughness, and, you know, it was, maybe that was a little unnecessary, but as a, you know, as a fan, I had to love it, the physicality. And, and those were some really cool games that we had under Brian Kelly. Um, you know, really just a lot of good games. I uh, had a great time under the Brian Kelly era. 
you know, we felt like we could always be there and compete for a championship. We expected to be there at the end of the year. Two playoff appearances. Uh, it, very impressive stuff from Brian Kelly there. Um, so, you know, we just want to say thank you to Brian Kelly for, for everything that you've done for us and wish him the best of luck in LSU. Yeah. Now, no, Notre Dame football is not the only team that's competing for a playoff spot in the coming few days. On Saturday, Notre Dame men's soccer will go to alumni, face off against the Pittsburgh Panthers at home for a spot in the NCAA College Cup. Me and Jacob Iron previewed the game. Hi, everybody. We take a break from football to talk a little football here. I'm Jacob Iron, joined alongside JJ Post as we're breaking down the men's soccer NCAA championship run as they play Pitt on Saturday at 5 p.m. in Alumni Stadium. So first, what do you think about this Notre Dame team? They won an ACC championship. Now they're here vying for a spot in the College Cup. Frankly, I love this Notre Dame team. This is a Notre Dame team that I think has all the tools to win a national championship. Because this is a Notre Dame team, you know, they don't, uh, Jack Lynn is your star man. They don't have any player that I think is going to be a first round uh, MLS draft pick. They don't have any players that, you know, I see playing in Europe one day. You know, they're all very, very good players. But what's best about this team is how they play as a team. They are a team that they can sit back and defend. They haven't conceded a goal in, I believe, six games now. They are on a perfect streak. They're not just good defensively. They are one of the best teams in the country defensively. But what's better than that, they can also counter. They can soak up pressure, absorb the pressure, and then use that to their advantage. They wait for their opponent to give them the space. They take the space well. They take their chances well. And what's more, it's a team that can do the most with what they're given. You know, if you give them one chance in the box, they'll take it. If you give them one set piece, they'll take it. They're a team that capitalizes off of mistakes. They are well in, they're good in possession. They know how to press. So it's not a team that you just need them to sit back and defend, but they cannot defend. So they're a team that can really do a bit of anything. They're an elite defensive team that can also press, that can also hold possession, that can also get make, make the most of set pieces. So I really like how this team, as a t unit, they do things together. They don't rely on one player to, you know, carry the load. They don't rely on one player to be the star. What they do is they just go out there, they play as a team, and they're better than the sum of their parts. And you're talking about a team that has 13 shutouts so far this season, a really a good testament to the defense as well as the goalie, Dowd. So now, what is the key for Notre Dame to take that ticket and punch it to carry? If you're Notre Dame, what I think you need to do is you need to be what you have been all year, which is a stout defensive unit that keeps the pressure on the opposing team still. So what you won't want to do is you don't want to be defensive in the sense that you put everyone back, let the opponent bring the game to you, let the opponent get 30 shots, and then hope you get one. What Notre Dame does is they are good defensive. They're solid defensive. You know, that back four, Burns, Jacobello, Quinton, you can go on and on about them. But they don't just sit back. They don't just make the opponent soak up, go to their team. What they do is they're good defensively, and they also force the opponent into mistakes of their own. They let their guys, they let Lynn, um, Rue, Russo, Rue, Everyone, they get forward, they push the game, they force the impetus to be on the opposing team, which I think if you're Notre Dame, you really like that because it gives your team two elements. You're both solid defensively, while also a team that you can't just game plan for by saying, okay, we'll hold possession, we'll attack them. So I think if you're Notre Dame, you have to be what you've been all year and then you know, be what you've especially been in recent weeks, which is a dominant team on set pieces, You know, long throw-ins, corner kicks. These are the moments where Notre Dame is going to have that physical advantage that they've had all year on teams. You know, the players like the 6-6 six, six Quinton get up there, Get the advantage, win your one-on-one -on -one matchup, and let the game come to Pittsburgh. And for Pitt, this is a game they want desperately. They already had Notre Dame play spoilers early this season when they face in the ACC semifinals. How angry and how fired up is Pitt? Do you feel are they going to come out of the tunnel and be ready to play? Yeah, I mean, this Pittsburgh God team's got to be fired up. You know, this is a team that every year under Jay Vidovich has gotten a little bit better, but they haven't reached the peak yet. They haven't won an ACC tournament yet. They haven't won an NCAA title yet. Every year they've gotten a little bit better. And this year, they got snubbed again by Notre Dame. You know, it's been Duke in the past. It's been Clemson in the past. Pittsburgh, I think, is a team that is going to be hungry to win this game, hungry to get back to the College Cup like them before. I think they're going to come out motivated, and I think they're going to be a tough test for this Irish team. And on Saturday, we're talking about a big matchup in Alumni Stadium at 5 p.m. If you're doing nothing and you're sitting in your dorm room saying, what should I do? Go to Alumni Stadium. But if you don't want to, you can watch me and JJ as we call a game for the ACC Network Extra. We'll go now go back to the desk. Thank you very much, Jake and JJ. That was a great insight into the incredible season that the men's soccer team here at Notre Dame has had so far. Uh, thank you for the uh, men's soccer team. Keep up the good work. You are representing yourselves and this university uh, very well, and the Irish fans all over the world will be cheering you on. So good luck. But now, uh, let's move on. Let's go. We're going to talk about the rest of college football uh, and the landscape that's going on. It's conference championship week. Huge week. Big college football playoff implications. So, JJ, what game are you looking at? 
I'm looking at Alabama versus Georgia because, you know, this is usually the marquee matchup for the last few years of championship weekend. But I also think this year, it's an interesting litmus test for both teams. Alabama, we're seeing now, you know, they beat Georgia in incredibly unconvincing fashion last week. You know, we're seeing the highlights of this game, but these are about the only two highlights from the game because that performance against an Auburn team quarterbacked by a quarterback with one leg was pretty dang bad for a team that wants to purport itself as a national title contender. So I think if you're Alabama, this is your chance to make your statement. Like, you know, you've had a lot of doubters. I'm one of them. If you want to prove you want to be a playoff team, beat Georgia, and I don't think anyone's going to be disrespecting Alabama anymore. Georgia, on the other hand, is an interesting team because no one's disputing they're the number one team in college football. They've dominated everyone they've played since week one. But they also haven't really played any teams of national contender caliber because Georgia, on no fault of their own, has a kind of a weak resume. Clemson, their marquee week one matchup didn't end up being, you know, all that this season. You know, uh, the other teams they played from the SEC, Kentucky, Arkansas, are solid teams, but they didn't draw Ole Miss, they didn't draw Texas A&M, they didn't draw Alabama in the regular season schedule, which are kind of the marquee SEC matchups, you know, you come to expect. So I think Georgia hasn't really played a team of national contender caliber this season. They've dominated all the non-contender teams they've played, but it's going to be interesting to see what they do against an Alabama team that is staffed with talent, has Nick Saban as head coach, who for my money is the best college coach in the sport. And, you know, it's going to be interesting to see what they do against a team that's going to, you know, for the first time, probably talent for talent, match up with them perfectly. Yeah, I think that's going to be a great game too. SEC championship never fails uh, to entertain. So. Georgia, Alabama should be a great one. One versus uh, now the three now uh, that they dropped uh, behind Michigan, but just one of many games. Uh, ben, what's the game that you're going to be checking out this week? Um, it may come to a as a surprise to some, but my eyes will be glued on the AAC championship all day. It's between Cincinnati and Houston. And listen, Cincinnati is a very, very good team, but I think Houston's better, and it starts with their defensive line. You need to rely on the defensive line. And I have a stat that you guys may find really interesting. Houston is currently third in the nation for sacks. They're tied with Alabama, and they're actually beating Georgia out in sacks, which is really impressive considering they have a top defense and they have Jordan Davis, who's one of the best D linemen in the country. So as I mentioned earlier, Houston has two keys to winning the game. I think Houston will be sneaky good in this game. First, as I mentioned earlier, rely on the defensive line. And then second, keep the ball out of Desmond Ritter's hand. So just essentially run the ball. You'll see right here, Desmond Ritter, before the defense give anything, boop, pops it right over your head, touchdown, high point by the receiver, easy money. They're going to probably try that against Houston. And so what you can do to prevent having Desmond Ritter throw darts all over your secondary is to essentially just run the ball. You have a really strong freshman in Alton McCaskill. He has 844 yards, and it's not quite the Heisman caliber year, but for a, for a freshman, it's very, very impressive. So I'm just looking at Houston. Put them on up, put Cincinnati on upset alert because I think Houston may be able to do it. Yeah, I definitely think that that game is not getting enough attention as it should. Right. As Cincinnati, Cincinnati's been a great team all year, but you know they've been prone to close games. Uh, and Houston's going to be the best team, uh, I think, in my opinion, besides Notre Dame that they've played all season. Uh, neutral site, you know, it should be a great. Is, is AAC neutral site, neutral site game? It's actually yes. in Cincinnati. It is in Cincinnati. It's my yeah. fault. Yeah, so it'll be it'll it will be a home game for Cincinnati, uh, but that should be a good one regardless. And then the, the game that I'm looking at personally, uh, I think that. This has the biggest implications on Notre Dame making the college football playoff. That is the Big 12 championship. That is going to be going to be played between the Oklahoma State Cowboys and the Baylor Bears. Uh, they have met once earlier this season. Oklahoma State took it. They had the home, the home field advantage. Uh, that game took place in early October, uh, and Oklahoma State ended up winning 24 to 14. Um, but looking at these teams, I think that, uh, well, here, as, as you can see here, Baylor, they rely heavily, heavily on the ground game. This is a touchdown uh, from that game against Oklahoma State by Abram Smith, and uh, he averages 111 rush yards per game, so he's definitely a threat on the ground. Uh, but, you know, they have, they have a little lightning to Abram's thunder, and that is in the form of Tristan Ebner. He is one of the best uh, punt and kick returners in the nation. They're a uh, second string running back, but really they both see the field uh, very much. So. Just like, uh, but, and so Baylor, they're gonna need to establish the run, but very similar, Oklahoma State. They are a team that likes to establish the run as well. Here, quarterback Spencer Sanders in the big, uh, in, in last week's rivalry game against Oklahoma, ran that for a touchdown. And then he'll hand it off to Jalen Warren here for the one yard touchdown to take the lead. Sanders and Warren are the two biggest playmakers in that Oklahoma State offense, uh, the quarterback running back combo. Warren uh, is the Big 12 newcomer of the year. And you know, both teams are gonna try to establish the run. Um, but it will be tough because both Oklahoma State and Baylor have phenomenal defenses. It seems like the Big 12 is turning into the SEC with this defensive revolution. Oklahoma State, uh, nationally ranked defense, uh, top five in both yards per game and points per game. Uh, so, or sorry, yards per game and yards per play. Uh, so it's going to be very difficult. I think whichever team establishes the run 
will end up winning the game. Uh, the turnover battle will also be interesting. And then one individual matchup that I'll be looking at uh, is top receiver Tay Martin on Oklahoma State. Uh, he's a really good player, one of the top receivers in the Big 12. But Jalen Petrie, he's the DB for, uh, for Baylor. He won Big 12 Defensive Player of the Year, one of the best cornerbacks in the nation. Uh, he's basically an island out there. So it'll be interesting to see if they can establish the run. That individual matchup will be awesome to watch. Well, and then not only in that game, um, there's another game that you know not, none of us three have mentioned yet, the Big Ten Championship. It's going to be Michigan and Iowa. What are you guys thinking about that one? I think that Michigan is at a hot point in the season, and there is there are a couple of arguments that Iowa could take them down. But I think with Aiden Hutchinson, you know they're unstoppable. They're going to get in the backfield, um, lose yardage for Iowa, and so I think that Michigan has a pretty easy win here. Yeah, while this game may not be the most high scoring, it will also not be the most interesting. Yeah. Michigan's a team that has just stacked with talent. They're on a high point momentum wise. Iowa is a great defense, but the offense I just don't think has the electricity. I saw a stat, you know, when when uh, Spencer Petras is even in like the top 100 quarterbacks of the week, Iowa's like nine and one, and he's only been that in like half the week. So it's just, you know, a bit unfortunate. This Iowa team is just so ground heavy, just so predicated on the defense being dominant. You know, I think they'll keep it close. I don't think Michigan's going to blow them away because I like, think Iowa's a scrappy team to be able to hang in there. But I don't think in the end they have the offensive firepower to really, you know, get the upset because they're going to need a real big game out of Spencer Petras if they want to pull this off. And I'm just not sure there's precedent to see that they'll get that. Yeah, I agree. I think that Michigan proved itself as one of the most physical teams in the nation this past week against Ohio State. Um, and so I'm with you guys there. I think Michigan uh, rolls to an easy win. But love to see Iowa make that a cool game. Um, but going forward, Let's talk about the conference championship weekend's implications on Notre Dame's chances of making the college football playoff. What do you guys think has to happen in order for the Irish to sneak in there? Ben, let's start with you. So I think, first off, Alabama needs to lose badly to Georgia. And I mean badly. I'm talking maybe triple digits if they can get to that far. Um, so I think that um, with Alabama losing, it either needs to be an Oklahoma State loss to Baylor in the Big 12 championship, or maybe a Michigan, but we talked about that earlier. It's not very likely. But I think that what we're going to be looking at is Cincinnati. I mentioned that earlier. Houston may be able to do it. If Houston loses and Alabama loses, I think Notre Dame's in. Yeah, this is my favorite segment. I, you know, the first time I came on the desk, it was right after the Cincinnati loss. And I said, you know, wait for chaos to happen. Chaos will happen. And right now, we need two more instances. Is, that, is Georgia beating Alabama even chaos at this point? No. We need one more chaos to happen for Notre Dame to make it in. If Georgia beats Alabama, I would hope the committee would keep a two-loss Alabama out. And then if that happens, if the number one uh, Georgia beats the team they're supposed to, you just need one of Oklahoma State, Cincinnati, or Michigan to lose. Alabama, I think, is the, you know, the, the underdog in that game, so I'm not going to call that an upset. But if Oklahoma State, Cincinnati, Michigan, one of them falls, I think the University of Notre Dame could very well be in the playoff. And I'm thinking there will be a lot of people, especially if it's Cincinnati, who does lose, who won't be very happy about it. Yeah, I think that I agree. I think that two of these uh, four teams need to lose in order for us to sneak in. Um, I know that the Oklahoma State finally jumped us this week, but that was to be expected um, by whoever has been following college football landscape and, and at least the committee for the past few years. Um, I, think that, I didn't think that there was any way that Notre Dame was going to get in over a one-loss Big 12 wow. champion. Uh, so we're going to need Baylor to come up with the upset there. Interestingly, though, do you guys think uh, that, say, a two-loss Baylor team could jump Notre Dame if they win in the Big 12 championship? Well, it's an interesting thought experiment because, you know, uh, you know, that team will have the committee's 13th data point, as they so put it, you know, the conference championship game that every year it kind of becomes a discussion again. Does Notre Dame get hurt by not having a conference championship? Should they get hurt by not having a conference championship? But I think if you're the committee, I think you already made clear that Brian Kelly leaving wasn't going to be a factor and Notre Dame needed a coach to be considered. Now they've got their coach, and especially they've got their narrative. You know, I'm a big fan of narratives over talent. And Notre Dame, this Notre Dame team has a storyline that I think the committee might just think whether they should be considering this or not might just be too compelling to leave out if this it's a one-loss Notre Dame team with a loss to perhaps in this scenario the number three seed Cincinnati. I think that's a quality loss. The committee has said before they value teams who lose. You know, they value losses to good teams. And I think if Cincinnati wins, then that loss will certainly be considered a quality quote-unquote loss. And I think if it's a two-loss Baylor team with you know two losses uh, or rather one loss that won't be above this Notre Dame loss, I don't. I think it's difficult to uh, you know put them in over them, especially since you know it, it's looking at two losses versus one. You know, we, we did some math on the show last week. You know, two is greater than one, as Jacob Irons would put it, <laughs> um, and that math holds true now. So uh, one loss is indeed an advantage there. But I also think the quality of loss is important. You know, this Baylor team lost the TCU, who was in their first game without their 20-year head coach. 
And uh, also, they lost to Oklahoma State, who, if Baylor wins, will no longer be in the top five. So I think Notre Dame will have both less losses than Baylor, as well as two, uh, Baylor will have two losses that are weaker losses than Notre Dame. I think by that logic, that will rule out the quote-unquote 13th data point. Yeah, I want to say that that's um, some pretty sound logic. I agree with it. But, you know, I don't think that you can ever quite tell what the committee is cooking up uh, in those Bama's meetings. I think the there. team we should be worried about. Yeah. Yeah. Bama, okay. They ben, love their Bama. Yeah, Ben, do you have any thoughts on, on the craziness and how this could shake out? So, I think that we should be watching and rooting for Baylor as much as we can. I think it's Oklahoma State. Oklahoma State, you know, a couple of weeks ago, Notre Dame was like, we're going to make the playoff. We're going to make it. This is the year. Mark, I mean, it wasn't Marcus Freeman. It was Brian Kelly. But... And then Oklahoma State comes in, they beat Oklahoma and just jams everything up for the Irish. And I think that we want Baylor, not we, sorry, Notre Dame wants Baylor to win. And I think that it's interesting because Marcus Freeman kind of saved Notre Dame in a way because the playoff did say they were going to consider um, teams that didn't have a coach or a key player. And so being without Brian Kelly, Notre Dame would probably get passed by Oklahoma State. They would get passed by Oklahoma State. But Marcus Freeman, being the great coach that he is, might have helped Notre Dame. He has never lost a game as Notre Dame head coach. Never. To consider these stats. Unbe undefeated on time. Undefeated. Yes. And then, so, you know, obviously, as Notre Dame students, Notre Dame fans, we're hoping that, you know, we get to make the playoff, compete for a national championship. That's, you, that's always the goal every year, in and out. Uh, but say that two of those four things don't happen, and, you know, Notre Dame could be stuck looking on the outside in. Uh, what type of bowl game do you think that, that Notre Dame could be looking at, you know, maybe at large, Fiesta or Peach? But what type of opponent, really, do you think that Notre Dame could be uh, facing there in, one, in a bowl game like that? Ben? I think that it's, I said this a couple of weeks ago in a segment, but I think it's going to be Michigan State in the mm -hmm. Fiesta Bowl. Mm -hmm. um, I don't think it'll be Alabama. Um, but so with, yeah, just Michigan State in the Fiesta Bowl. Yeah. My dream scenario here is Michigan loses and we get to play Michigan in the Fiesta Bowl because, right. you know, I love the Michigan rivalry. Uh, I don't love Michigan, and I'd rev revile any chance to beat them in a game of significance. But I think Michigan State is a very likely opponent. I think the Fiesta Bowl is our most likely destination. You know, maybe the Peach Bowl could be interesting against a team, you know, an a a whoever wins the ACC championship game, like Pitt or Wake Forest. I think that would, you know, you know, for better or for worse, be the easiest game we could get because I think the ACC championship will probably be the weakest of the, you know, the various Power Five championships. So I think it's Fiesta Bowl that's our most likely destination. I think Michigan State is probably the most likely team to face. Yeah, I think that that's, you know, probably the, the most likely out of all, you know, if all of the favorites win this weekend, all the conference championships go as expected. Expected, you never know what to expect in college football, but, Chaos. you know, for the sake of the word, um, then I think Michigan State would be the most likely. Um, possibly they could throw us against a group of five. I think that could be interesting as well. Um, and I think that, uh, you know, like, I say, you know, Houston beats Cincinnati, maybe they throw us against Houston, something like that. You know, you really don't know uh, what to expect, but, you know, all in all, I think we can agree that this conference championship weekend is going to be very exciting, and everyone who is a fan of the Notre Dame Irish is going to be tuning in. The eyes are going to be glued to the television, hoping that two of those four teams lose, and the Irish can sneak into the playoff um, and, you know, compete for a national championship. And that's going to about wrap us up here at Shamrock Sports. I'm Kieran Campbell alongside analysts Ben Bailey and JJ Post. Thank you so much for joining me, guys. Had a great time. And uh, thank you for tuning in, all viewers, and hope to see you again next semester. Uh, but actually, we do have a show coming up uh, on Monday. We're going to have some really cool stuff about Notre Dame's uh, look into the bowl projections. And uh, so make sure to tune into that. But thank you for joining us, and have a good night.